Dark Gauntlet. All right, ladies and gentlemen, before we start, I got a few quick statements to make here. There is no way to do this video without showing who eventually joins your team. So if you're the kind of person who thinks the case for Final Fantasy IX spoils the game because you know who joins your party, this isn't going to be the review for you, so turn it off now. Due to the sheer magnitude of this game, this review is going to be broken up into sections with very little crossover between them. This is to keep everything clear, cut, and in line, so hopefully it can be best understood. Now, we've got a lot to talk about, so I want to jump into our very first category... The Basics. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a massive linear action JRPG with pseudo-MMO elements released at the end of 2017, developed by Monolith Soft and published by Nintendo for the Nintendo Switch. Xenoblade Chronicles is an offshoot of the Xeno series that started on the PlayStation 1 with Xeno Gears and continued on the PlayStation 2 with Xeno Saga 1, 2, and 3. And yes, I say Xeno and not Zeno, I do not know what's correct. While this is called Xenoblade Chronicles 2, it would be a miss to refer to this as a sequel. If anything, this is a side story to that of Xenoblade Chronicles 1. If you haven't played Xenoblade Chronicles 1, you can still play this. There is no context given in the first game that you'll need here, and aside from one single reference, the events of that game will never be mentioned. In almost every way, shape, and form, this is its own entirely separate entity, with its own unique setting, unique story, and unique battle system. So let's start this off by talking about... The setting. First off, let me just say that I am absolutely floored at the originality of this world. It was one thing in Xenoblade Chronicles 1 to venture across two massive static titans, but in Xenoblade Chronicles 2, you venture across many animated titans as they trudge their way endlessly through a radiant and brilliant cloud sea known as Allrest. At the epicenter of this cloud sea is something known as the World Tree, which is believed to be a nearly inaccessible gateway to a new land known as Elysium. And let me just repeat one of those things here. This world is built on the back of titans who roam in a cloud sea. A fucking cloud sea. I've never seen a setting like this before. It's amazing how much a simple notion like replacing water with clouds can shift the entire perspective I have on a world's design. This one design choice thrust this game into the upper echelons of originality for me. So far as I know, there's no statement on the size of this world, and due to the amount of it that's filled with empty cloud space, a true meaningful estimate could be very hard to calculate. But even if its scale is somehow smaller than Xenoblade 1 or Skyrim or similar games, the density of content within this world is in leagues of its own. And the way they utilize the space within these areas really gets the most out of it that can be got. Each area of the game is packed with a wealth of history, and most areas, save for a few, have a great attention to small details. Races such as the Nopon return from Xenoblade Chronicles, and many new races are introduced. In a short while, we will return to some of these talking points to discuss the art direction of the game, but now that the setting is established, let's discuss... The Story. In as few words as possible, and it's gonna be a lot of words. And while remaining as spoiler-free as possible, the story goes something like this. You play as a boy named Rex. Rex is a salvager, and a very good one at that. He lives on his own aboard the back of a small titan known as Azurda, whom he calls Gramps. One day while roaming the Cloud Sea, Rex sees a titan collapse and fall below the surface of the clouds. This event sets in motion the idea that all rest and all of its titans are dying. With fewer and fewer titans left, it becomes clear that unless something drastic happens, all life on all rest will end. There is no land in the Cloud Sea, and life cannot thrive beneath the Cloud Sea. So when the last titan collapses, so too does all of civilization. This is where Rex turns his sights towards the World Tree. Ancient legends talk of a place atop the world tree known as Elysium. Much like the definition of the term, Elysium is a paradise land, a place that can really only exist in the afterlife or in mythology. As such, many people of all rest believe it is just a fairy tale, but Rex is different. Rex is somebody whose heart is bigger than his brain, and he has a child's sense of wonder. 
and so he stands firm in his belief that the place actually exists. Getting to Elysium, though, is a task well beyond the abilities of a lowly salvager like Rex, and it's not a task he's chomping at the bit to begin. One day, Rex is approached by a nopon at the Argentum Trading Guild and offered an exorbitant amount of money to take on a salvaging mission for a group of unfamiliar adventurers. Smitten by the money, Rex accepts the job without even questioning what it is. This job has him recover a human body from beneath the Cloud Sea, and this is where everything goes belly up. Events transpire quickly. Rex is the game ends and the credits roll. Oh, uh, no, wait, that's not how it goes. Rex awakes in a sort of mind space version of Elysium where he meets a girl standing next to a tree. This girl is named Pyra. Pyra is what's known as a blade. Blades are kind of like people and creatures summoned through cores that fight for people named drivers. Not everybody can be a driver though, their spirit must resonate with the core to be a driver. After a short conversation with Pyra, Pyra gives up half of her life, transferring her core to Rex so that he may the game ends and the credits roll. Oh, uh, no, wait. Realizing now that he is a driver and in possession of his first ever blade, Rex and Pyra set out to climb the world tree and find Elysium so that the people of Allrest will have a place to live when the Titans all succumb to old age and die. And while they are doing all this, the group who hired Rex to salvage Pyra from below the Cloud Sea are in pursuit of him because Pyra isn't some ordinary blade and they have big plans they require her for. Beyond this point, the story spirals out of control and becomes well beyond my abilities to sum up. This game is divided into 10 chapters. Each chapter contains about 5 hours of story content, except for chapter 10, which maybe has 2 or 3. With that, it stands to reason the game can be beaten in or around 50 hours. But let's not make the mistake and assume any of us will be beating the game quite that quickly. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 has an outrageous amount of side content, and most of it simply cannot and should not be ignored. Although there's only 5 hours of story content in each chapter, I found myself spending around 10 hours in each, making my runtime with this game nearly 100 hours in length. Believe it or not, I only managed to get it down to 100 hours because I drastically reduced the amount of side quests I'd done in the last three chapters so that I could have this review ready before Monster Hunter World releases. I will return to talking about the side quests and additional content variety later, but for now, I want to give you a quick rundown of what my reactions to each chapter was like throughout the game, because giving you a rundown of the story beyond this point is just insane. So here we go. Chapter 1. Holy crap, this game is not messing around. While it doesn't have the same bombastic first 10 minutes of Xenoblade Chronicles, it sets up a bleak future for the world of Allrest and introduces you to the majesty of its world and characters in an absolutely stunning way. Action-oriented cutscenes and invigorating music set the tone for what is sure to be an adventure of epic proportions. Chapter 2. Alright, so we slow down a little bit here to get better acquainted with the world, the people, the land, the politics, and new story-relevant characters. It's clear we're already developing subplots, and tutorials are running rampant. Although the tutorials already feel intrusive here, you can expect they won't slow down until nearly 40 hours into the game. The density of the world and what you can do is really starting to be realized, but even here, it's nothing compared to what will come later. The start of this chapter is a tad on the slow side, but it ends on a very climactic, action-oriented note. Chapter 3. There's more of what's going on in Chapter 2. A lot of tutorials, world development, and subplot development, but man does this game ever shift by the end of this chapter. Most people mark the end of Chapter 3 as a turning point for the game, and I have to agree. This is where you feel the weight of your emotional investment up until this point. Once you complete this chapter, it's full steam ahead. You will not be putting the game down after this. Chapter 4. Following the events of Chapter 3, a wealth of new side quests, game, and battle mechanics have opened up. So much so that I didn't truly understand the new combat mechanics for at least another 20 hours. It's in this chapter some of the shady political dealings of Allrest begin to unfold and the shape of Allrest's seedy underbelly begins to show. The politics and RPGs are some of the most engaging plot devices for me and here is where the game began to speak all of my languages, but at this point they were just whispers. Chapter 5. Yes, the tutorials are basically over at this point, and the land of Allrest is falling into complete political turmoil. Bring it on, this is my shit. Chapter 6. Holy shit, oh my god, how can this get any better? I thought the political turmoil of Chapter 5 was cool, but this is something else. Also, no spoilers, but oh my god, my fucking heart at the end of this chapter. Chapter 7. Wow. 
Now I'm depressed, but in a good way, guys. The game had my heart and it's literally tearing it apart. At least I was depressed until the end of the chapter. The end of the chapter kicked my ass into feeling the most pumped up a person can feel without going into cardiac arrest. Chapter 8. <sighs> this chapter is interesting, I guess. A lot of neat character development happens and a lot of history is unfolded, which I appreciate, but I truly did not like the new area we had to explore. It just felt like a bit of a slog. But like every chapter, it amounts to something pretty badass in the end. Chapter 9, everything is falling apart and it's damn beautiful. I'm hyped now boys, full steam ahead to chapter 10. Chapter 10, I literally felt every human emotion possible during this chapter. This game was awesome. I hope this rundown of reactions was useful to you guys in some way. As I stated earlier, I couldn't possibly explain the story beyond the intro. There's no way to convey the pace of the story or the shape that the story unfolds in beyond the intro, so I hope my testimonial kind of helps color it just a little bit more than I was able to without it. Fact of the matter is, you're going to be doing so much side content that the pace you experience the game with is going to be way different than the pace I experience it with. Of course, we're quite a few minutes into this at this point, and you're probably wondering, since I haven't said a word about it, what is the gameplay actually like? Let's talk about... The battle mechanics. First things first, the battle is dense as all hell, and many people make it as far as 60 or 80 hours in and still lack a basic understanding of some aspects. I want to state here as well for returning Xenoblade fans that this battle system isn't exactly like the one in Chronicles 1 or Chronicles X. What I consider the most intriguing aspect of Chronicle 1's battle system is nowhere to be found in this game and that is, of course, the ability to foretell the future and intercept it. The game is still an action RPG. You engage your enemy in auto attack, and you can still select moves known as arts from a list of icons that work on cooldowns. Unlike the first Xenoblade Chronicles, these are not ready the second you start battle, at least not at the beginning of the game. As you fill in your character's affinity chart, you can unlock the ability for arts to be ready as soon as battle begins. Prior to unlocking this ability, battles tend to feel a bit on the slow side. Luckily, you unlock it pretty early on. The arts you have to choose from are based on the blades you have equipped. Each party member can have a max of three blades equipped at a time. Blades, much like arts, have a cooldown timer. Aside from the blade you have active when you begin battle, the rest will need to be charged up before you can switch to them during battle. The blades that you can choose to bring into battle are dependent on the blades that are bonded to the driver. Bonding a blade to a driver involves crushing a core crystal and summoning a new blade from it. Whichever driver crushes the core crystal will bond with the blade within it. Most blades you will get in this game are very similar in nature and referred to as common blades. Rare blades are very tough to get but infinitely more useful. There's less than 40 of them in the game and the RNG is crushing, but it makes receiving them feel all the better. That said, I do wish the RNG was not as hardcore as it is. You can boost your odds of getting rare blades in a number of ways. There are different levels of cores from common to rare to legendary, with each subsequent core having a higher chance of producing a rare than the last. You can also add boosters to cores before opening them. I didn't understand what the boosters done for a good 60 hours, but if you look at the swirling energy around a core when you use them, you can see you are boosting your odds of getting a blade with the elements represented by this energy. These odd boosts are so minimal though, it's hard to feel like you're actually doing something. While I've seen some people retire the game after 100 hours and have every blade unlocked, a buddy of mine named The Funny Nerd, who's been putting out a lot of great Xenoblade content on YouTube lately by the way, link in the description, spent an unspeakable amount of hours getting his last missing blade. Every single day he would grind out 99 rare cores and as many legendaries as he could manage. He boosted his luck to 999. He'd done everything he could conceivably think for days to get that last missing blade. 700 core crystals later, he got it. 700. I'm sure he was over the moon when he finally seen it pop up on his screen, but I do personally feel those odds are just a bit on the side of being too harsh. I'll admit up front that I was a good 10 blades short on collecting all the rares, and I'm a little miffed about it because, as the outrage around the game will tell you, quite a few of these blades trigger quite the lascivious feelings. Well, that's what the outrage says anyway. Maybe we should take a look ourselves. <laughs> I 
All right, well, that's not so bad. I mean, sure, it's sexualized, pretty hardcore, but it's not like they're stripping off their pants and shoving their bare ass in the camera at all times. <laughs> or maybe they are. Getting back into the battle mechanics. Sorry I had to go off in that long tangent about the blades, but the blades do function as your weapon, so it is kind of important. Now earlier we talked about how different blades have different arts, but these arts are actually tied to the weapons they use and are called driver arts. There is a subclass of arts called blade arts that are unique to the blade itself. Blade arts are pretty powerful attacks, but their biggest use ties into this chart up here, which many people take far too long trying to understand, so let's do a quick rundown. If I use a blade art of any level, you will see this chart appear up here. When this chart appears up here, a timer will appear over here. What's going on here is that I've started a combo attack. Based on the element of the blade art I use, two different blade arts can be chained off of it, but the catch is that the blade art that follows it must be a level 2 or higher blade art of an element represented in the second column and it must be performed before the timer over here runs out. Once this is done, a new timer starts and you must perform a level 3 or higher blade art that corresponds to the elements in the branching path of column 3. Again, this must be done before the new timer runs out. Provided you made it all the way to the end of this chart, a special attack will launch and plant an orb of that attack's element on the enemy. These orbs come in handy during chain attacks. Chain attacks can only be performed when you fill all three slots in this meter up here. When performing a chain attack, all of your party members will use a blade art of your choice on the enemy. Choose blade arts that correspond to the orb's weakness to destroy the orb while attacking. If you destroy the orb, you extend your chain attack for an additional round. You can plant a ton of orbs on the enemy before launching a chain attack. If you planted enough orbs on the enemy and you break them in one round, you will perform a full burst, but at this point, we're getting a little too deep into the combat mechanics. One thing they did carry over from Xenoblade 1 was the auto attacks, breaks, topples, and directional effects. When you approach enemies, your standard attack happens automatically, and these charge up driver arts. Breaks are special status effects you inflict with certain driver arts. They have no immediate effect, but allow the use of topple, which can then also be used in conjunction with launch attacks for heavy damage. Directional effects too are exactly what they sound like. When standing on certain angles to enemies, different attacks will have different effects. Getting on the correct angle is not always easy though, due to the aggro system. Enemies who are aggro to you will almost always be facing you, so make good use of aggro reducing attacks before you launch attacks from specific directions. There are no items in battle. Healing is left up to driver arts or potion drops from enemies in battle. Revives are tied to the chain attack meter up here. If Rex dies and these meters are empty, the battle ends. During an auto attack, the second your auto attack hits the enemy, if you choose to use a driver art at that very moment, you actually get enhanced effects from that driver art, and it actually does a lot more to charge your driver arts and your blade arts. There is a full status effect and elemental system in place, but at the risk of being too much of a tutorial in and of itself, it may be best to move on from here. I think this does more than enough to give you a rundown of what to expect from battle in Xenoblade Chronicles 2. Battle mechanics expand even more beyond this, and there's quite a bit I didn't talk about, but the late game battle mechanics that get introduced I can't really show due to visual spoilers. Let's talk now about the various progression systems and side quests in the game. Progression systems and side quests. Of course, this is an RPG, so you can expect that killing enemies will net you XP to level up with. But what's surely mind-boggling is all the other areas of the game you can level up, and how easy it might be to miss some of them. Let's start with Affinity. Every single blade and character in the game has an affinity chart. These charts contain passive and active skills. Some skills can be used in combat, some in conversation, some while opening chests, mining rock, or gathering plant life. These affinity charts can be very complicated. Take a quick look at them and you'll realize they are not just going to fill themselves in. Many blocks on this chart must be filled in by doing specific things. Some rare blades like Boreas can be filled in almost entirely by feeding him, but for the most part, the average rare blade will have a myriad of requirements. 
from killing X amounts of specific enemy types, talking to X amount of specific types of people, viewing specific heart-to-heart -heart events, sending specific blades out on specific mercenary missions, etc, etc. A lot of the time, these quests will even open up cutscenes that fill in the blade's history and personality. And that's one thing I love about this game. The rare blades are not just throwaway characters, and they all have a world of depth behind them. Most rare blades even have specific side quest lines that let you know who they are, what their likes and dislikes are, what they aspire to, where they come from, and where they're going. These are far from small quest lines too. Some may take hours to fully complete. These blades are more than the Pokemon S type captures people often pass them off as. These are real fleshed out characters and make up the world and story of Xenoblade Chronicles 2 as much as your main cast. And because I briefly mentioned it, Heart to Hearts are dialogue events that can be found around the map in typically scenic locations that unlock special abilities for the characters involved with them. Rex and his party members also have affinity trees, but they are leveled by gathering affinity points. In addition to affinity points, there's weapon points. Weapon points are gathered through battle, with bonus points being handed out upon completing Blade Affinity Charts. Weapon points are used to level up the driver arts of a weapon. Each weapon has four different driver arts, but only three can be used at a time. For the most part, this is how all of your drivers and blades will be leveled up, with the exception of Poppy, who is an artificial blade. To level up Poppy, you must gather crystals and chips by playing a mini game called Tiger Tiger. Tiger Tiger is a simple game, but you're either gonna love or hate leveling Poppy up this way. Personally, while I don't hate the game Tiger Tiger, I don't like this leveling system. To truly get anywhere, you'll be replaying the same stages in Tiger Tiger several times over, and this kind of grind is just not fun to me. Earlier, I mentioned to unlock some affinity rewards, you may need to send people out on mercenary missions, but I never explained what those were. Starting in Chapter 4, you can send Blades out to passively complete missions through a mercenary organization. Each mission has a set of requirements for the Blades that you send, with additional bonus skills that, if used, will complete the missions faster. Mercenary missions feed into city development. Yes, you can even level up your fucking cities. Spending money, finishing side quests, and completing mercenary missions develop each city in the game. The more developed a city becomes, the more items there are available for purchase. The more side quests appear, the more discounts you get. It may seem like with all these side quests and bonus missions at your disposal, that becoming overleveled is almost inevitable. But there is even a system in place for that. A lot of things that give you XP, such as discovering new areas, do not give that XP directly to you. That experience is actually set aside and can only be received by resting at an inn. Oftentimes, you'll have several levels of XP just waiting for you here, and it's up to you if you want to take it or not. If you feel the game is starting to get too easy, but you still want to pursue and do all of the side quests, then you can do that and control how much stronger you get along the way. It's really quite a simple yet genius solution to the problem. All these reasons and more is why a 5 hour chapter in the game would often take me 10 hours or more. I was constantly chasing down these excellently written side quests and developing my cities and filling in my affinity charts. It really is quite amazing what they pull off in side content alone. Hell, there's even this little dinosaur creature you can feed and raise into adulthood as the game progresses. This game literally has everything. Although I will admit in some regards, some of this began to feel a bit like a time vampire by the end. I won't complain about certain side quests seeming to go on forever, cause they almost always get me emotionally invested and are well worth the investment of time, but mercenary missions really felt like a drag to me by the end. As your mercenary rank goes up, you can send out more and more mercenary teams at once and complete mercenary missions faster and faster. It got to the point where every 10 to 20 minutes I was opening my mercenary menu to begin a new mercenary quest. Every time people come back from a quest, you have to look at how all of them leveled up, even if you truly don't care about the development of the people you sent out. This process only takes about one minute on its own, but then you gotta deploy a new team, which should take about one to two minutes to select and send out, which means the process is three minutes every 10 to 15 minutes of gameplay. You will receive and deploy mercenary teams well over 200 times throughout the run of the game, and after a while, that time really adds up and can be quite grating. By chapter nine, I actually stopped doing mercenary quests altogether, and it felt like a huge weight was lifted off my shoulders. Of course, this means I also didn't get any 
more benefits from developing my cities. It's a great system to have in the game for sure, but I do wish it could be streamlined just a little better. Another thing that tended to irk me was the field skill checks. As you play, you may come across obstacles that take things like level 5 earth mastery and level 3 lockpicking, or some variation of skills to complete. To pass these field skill checks, you must have blades equipped to your party members who have skills that amount to the number next to the field skill check. Unequipped blades do not count towards the checks. This is a good system to make sure you can't brute force your way through any obstacle, but I really wish they had a way to auto-calculate if there was a formula of equipped blades that could solve the problem or not. I found it incredibly annoying to keep opening my blade menu, looking through each and every one of their skills and doing the work myself. I would often look through my blades for 5 or more minutes for the right combination of skills to pass the check, only to unequip the blades I used right after to of course come across another check I need to equip different blades for two minutes later. Perhaps an update can solve this, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. It's just an annoyingly time-consuming process. Now this just about covers all of the different types of progression systems and side quests in the game. From here I want to move on to talking about some more technical aspects. Performance, Sound, and Art Design Let's none of us claim we have some sort of holy switch, alright? The game doesn't run the best, I know this, you know this. The resolution is subpar for the generation. I personally never seen it hit above 720p, and I have personally seen it dip below 400. The frame rate attempts to lock at 30fps, but it fails miserably in many areas, docked and undocked. While for the most part I think the game runs and looks fine enough, there are very notable exceptions. Due to some sort of odd memory dump issue, if you approach a large town and the open field without booting to the main menu in between the two, the frame rate and resolution tanks. And just looking at this here, we seem to be in the low 20s for FPS, and maybe a little above 400 on the resolution. It feels like it runs in slow motion until the frame rate clicks back in. Texture popping can be quite insane at times, and at other times, this happens. grass phasing in and out of existence in more Ardain. The camera offers a lot of control for the player and that feels great, but it doesn't quite know how to respond to the environment, which makes navigating narrow spaces a bit headache inducing. The battle camera as well when casting blade arts doesn't really seem to know what to do with itself. And once during a really emotional scene that I won't show for spoiler reasons, the textures on a few characters didn't load, making the whole scene look derpy as hell. Now with all that said, in my nearly 100 hours of playtime, this did not affect me enough to hurt my overall experience. Yes, I do truly wish the FPS problems in towns were better. Thankfully, the towns are not areas where one needs really fast reflexes or to worry about controller inputs being dropped. In fact, I never once felt like I lost a controller input. Of course, due to how intensive the game is, don't expect the Switch to last much longer than 3 hours when it's undocked. The game controlled fine, and the button mapping was excellent aside from one choice. X opens the map, and plus opens your menu tree. This feels backwards to me and foregoes a lot of JRPG mainstays. And not in a way I enjoyed. Straight through to the end of the game, I was hitting the wrong button and opening my map when I didn't intend to. The art design. Oh boy, I do not like Rex's design at all. He looks like he belongs in Kingdom Hearts, and Pyra, as hot as I think she is, looks kind of like a race car. Unpopular opinion, but Petroka is where it's at. Sure, she may be a bit ordinary, but this Amy Lee looking Evanescence chick is my kind of gal. Second unpopular opinion, but there's a lot of talk about the best and worst looking blades, and many people put Korra on their list of worst. Listen, folks. There is no blade that looks better from the back than Korra. Now you either learn to appreciate the booty, or you unsubscribe to my channel. 
I do actually love this art design. It's not the most graphically impressive game, and some characters do look like default creative characters, but overall the anime design choices and art direction will have this game standing the test of time. True, some textures look very outdated, but holistically this game is going to be timeless. The sound design. Let's break this part up into categories as well, starting with music. On a scale from Xenoblade Chronicles X cringe songs to Xenoblade Chronicles, this is a solid Xenoblade Chronicles 2, which falls just under the Xenoblade Chronicles position. It's a truly amazing soundtrack with some killer pieces, just not as many as the original Xenoblade Chronicles, and not used with as much tact. But I gotta give special credit to the songs with full vocals that play during really intense parts of the game. These gave me chills. Also, I gotta give special props to the solo piano work. That shit really gets me and really punctuates the mood when it's used. Of course, this is more excellent work by Team Ace, Kenji Hiramatsu, Manami Kiyota, and of course, Yasunori Mitsuda. Next, the sound effects. 98% good. What I mean by this is all the sound effects sound great everywhere they are used, but some scenes and actions are oddly devoid of them. Not much more I can say about this, so I want to move on to one huge point of contention I see in regards to this game. The voiceovers. The English voiceovers. I don't think the English voice cast is that great. You guys can like it, I can dislike it. Honestly, I don't give a fuck, but I'm gonna explain myself here. Even when considering cultural differences from the accents, the English voice acting often doesn't amount to the original character personalities. Nia sounds much older than she should, Zeke sounds much more posh and snobby, Morag more feminine, Mithra more monotone, and Rex can't project to save his life. I played most of the game in Japanese and watched my fiance going through most of it in English, and the difference to me is night and day. Now I know people are going to defend the voiceovers in the comments, and that's cool. This game has space for both of us. That's why it has English and Japanese audio options. Granted, you need to download the Japanese audio as a patch. Overall, I can't exactly say that the English voice actors were bad, I just think they were misdirected. With the exception, of course, being Rex's screams, those were just bad. A child salvager. Jin, don't tell me we're gonna have to hire some babysitters for this outing, too. What the hell? You look as much like a kid as I do, lady. But... There's a place where there's <laughs> Some characters in English are spot on representations such as Gramps, Dromark, Van Damme, and even Rex when he isn't trying to project. Some English characters I would even say are better, but overall the Japanese voice acting this time beats out the English one by miles for me. At the end of the day, this is just going to come down to preference. I heard most of the game in both languages, and I am absolutely firm in my belief. And you can be absolutely firm in yours too, whether it's different or not. Now for some closing thoughts. Closing thoughts. I really wish I could find a way to express the depth of the characters and the world here but I'll have to leave them as light as I have and let you experience them on your own. There's so much in this review in general I just didn't mention, but with a game this big and in the interest of staying spoiler free and not being a 40 minute video, I leave the rest up to you to discover. At the end of all things, Xenoblade Chronicles 2 reminds me a lot of Xenogears. Not in terms of its writing or gameplay exactly, but in the fact that it absolutely excels to the point of approaching masterclass categories with just a few flaws to hold it back. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is absolutely an easy game to recommend to JRPG fans, and one of the best ways to start a new year in gaming, but it is hurt by some performance issues, crushing RNG, and mechanics that can take an annoying amount of time out of your day. Most issues I can see people having with a game such as the voice acting, or the possibility to become overleveled, all have systems in place to work around. In spite of its massive amount of content, this might not be a game for completionists. The prospect of 100%ing this game is beyond my scope of imagination. With so much depth, so many characters, so many quests, and so much to level up, it's possible to play this for 200 hours and still not see the end in sight. This is a game for the true RPG fanatic who is looking to sink their teeth into something big, but not for those who can't keep track of the sheer volume 
of battle and leveling mechanics. Its writing will strike the kind of comedic tone you would expect from a perverted anime one minute, and will be ripping out your heart in another. It will make you smile as romance blossoms in real time, and pump you up as the tides of battle turn in your favor. To listen to the music after you've completed the game is to be whisked away into a fantastical world aboard giant titans in a cloud sea, a setting unlike anything you've ever experienced and likely could have never imagined. Battles may start on the easy side, but by the end, when you're expected to be a seasoned vet, you'll be pulling out all the stops and using every trick in your book to defeat the high-level special named enemies and bosses. And with a bit of work on the problem areas in a future Xenoblade 3, I can see this series setting a new standard for JRPGs as a whole. And so guys, I'm leaving it at that. I'm out of breath, I'm dizzy, my hands are going numb from talking for so long. That's a first. If it helped at all and you guys liked it, you guys know the deal. Like, comment, subscribe, links to socials are in the description. And as always, thanks for watching. Well, the soundtrack is great, it still doesn't top the best song ever written. The best song ever written, of course, is the McDonald's logo. And no, I don't mean the jingle, but the actual logo, the two golden arches. Nothing can ever top the McDonald's logo. So, uh, Tark's Gauntlet, is it? Um, I'm YouTube. Oh, sorry, I'm not even wearing a name tag. So I've been watching your growth over the last year. You've been uploading pretty consistently for the past few weeks. Uh, your subscriber retention's been pretty high, and your engagement's been pretty high as well. We're thinking of adding you to our list of upcoming promising YouTubers. Oh, sweet, yeah. Uh, 2017 has been great, actually. Very consistent. It would be a shame right now if a 90-hour JRPG just dropped into my lap and threw off all of my progress. I'm sorry, I don't think I met you. Oh, hi, sorry, I didn't introduce myself. Um, my name's Nintendo. Uh, I was wondering if you heard of our new game, Xenoblade Chronicles 2? Oh, this this looks great, thanks! Mm, yeah, we're gonna have to go ahead and retract your name from that list now, sorry.